In 2010, the US was, of course, the number one economy, but China was number two. It had not been in those earlier years. And in 2010, you still had Japan, Germany, France, UK, but you did have Brazil in that 10, and then Italy, and then India. So you saw the first appearance of those developing countries. The projections for 2050 are, and I'd like to give you these, even though reading lists is not an attractive thing to do after dinner, but I will anyway. China will have a $70 trillion income. The US will be $38 trillion. India, $37 trillion. Brazil, 11 Mexico, Russia, Indonesia, then Japan, UK, and Germany, then Nigeria, France, South Korea, Turkey, Vietnam, then Canada, then the Philippines, Italy then pokes its head up, Iran, Egypt, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. That is a very different ranking than I think most people would, at the tables here, would automatically think of. And so you have in that top 22 countries, countries that you would never expect to be in the leading economic powers in the world, but that's what it's going to be like. And that uh, clarity of result is something that is usually generally unclear in the short term in most political uh, views, campaigns, observations. And it's unclear now, particularly with what's going on in the economies around the world, because the major concern that we have in the West is how we're going to get things moving in terms of the leading economies. That's what's on the mind of President Obama. It's also what's on the mind of just about every Western leader. And they're not talking about any of the stuff I've been talking about because it's not of immediate interest. What is of immediate interest is getting things moving again. And so the debates that are taking place at the moment are debates about your position in the OECD. They're about whether you're pushing forward. There are debates about your exports. There are debates about getting your economy running. And... Uh, I had the pleasure of reading uh, an article by Wayne Swan, which has just come out. I don't know in what journal, but it was, a, I think, a remarkable uh, uh, piece uh, in which he talks about Australia's position in that grouping, the fact that uh, it's been a country of, that has been pretty egalitarian in its way, Obama has said inequality is the defining issue of our time because in the United States at this moment, the top 1% of income earners, the top 1% is responsible for 18% of the GDP. In this country, it's around 7 or 8, I understand. That's up a long way in terms of what the top 1% has. But what we're seeing is an unequal development going on. And that also is not a particularly healthy development in our societies. So there are a number of changes that are happening at the minute. And I'm not saying that any of them is defining in terms of the way in which we should live, but there certainly has been a huge change in, uh, in what's been happening and the fact in the years from 1979 to 2007, the top 1% of the population had incomes rise by close to 300%. The middle class in that same period saw their incomes rise 40%. So the distortion between those that are in the top 1% and those who are in the middle class is very great. And by the way, this is not inconsistent with the development in many of the other leading countries. So the issues that I think we now have to face are different issues. They're issues of how do we adapt? 
how do we get our kids prepared for that new world? How do we ourselves change in our orientation? To understand a bit more what is transparently clear in front of us. How is it that we can take a certain responsibility to look at a world which is already different and which in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years will be increasingly different? And that is a real challenge. It's a real challenge because most of us, and I include myself, were not educated in this way. I learned about British history rather than Asian history. I was never very good at it anyway, but I, at least I had it in the textbooks. I don't recall ever learning about what happened in China. I learned about what happened in India, but only insofar as it affected the United Kingdom. It had nothing to do with the Indians. And that is something which we just have to get over. And parallel with that, we've had a situation where the economic strength of the West is significantly weakened. We've been borrowing the hell out of what we can borrow. And as you well know, the borrowing levels of many countries, including the United States, has reached uh, levels that are uh, not sustainable. We have a debt to GDP ratio in the United States, which is now 70%. If you add the other debts that have the, in the United States, which are debts for the future, it gets to 100%. But I'm talking about the net debts, which are 70 they haven't reached what they reached in Greece of 140, 150% or 160%. I'm not trying to relate the United States to Greece. But I am saying, as we look around the world, including in Europe, uh, that we have borrowed too much, lived too well, without really paying for it. And that is true. And that's why, in Europe at the present time, a lot of people are very worried, and not just about Greece, but about Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and about the very existence of the European common market. Uh, we're very fortunate at the moment that we have in the leadership of the European Bank, uh, Mario Draghi, who is a, a remarkable person, and that we have running Italy, Mario Monti, who is another remarkable person. So we have some very good leaders that have been thrown up but we also have a political situation in Europe which is, I would have to say, fragile. And we look at France and we look at Germany, it's not at all clear where the continuing leadership is going to be. So we are coming into a period here which is pretty difficult. And we have elections coming up in the United States. And I think at this moment, the, probably the odds are on the president getting back but the margin is getting less. It's gone up and down. I, I wouldn't begin to predict what might happen. But I am saying that the Western leadership and the Western governance is at a point of uncertainty. And it wouldn't matter so much if it was uncertain if you had a strong debt situation, which we don't have, and if we had a strong global situation in the West, which we also don't have. What we have is a China with $3 trillion of reserves, a 7.5% growth rate, an India with a 6.5% growth rate, and the growth in developing countries at a level which is twice the level that we have in the West. And it's very likely that Europe will have a negative growth this year. So I'm not trying to foreshadow doom and gloom what I am trying to say is that in terms of our own understanding of the way the world is going, in terms of our preparation for the new world, we've done a pretty lousy job in educating the people that come after us. And in my case, I did a pretty lousy job of educating myself. I had to learn pretty quickly when I got to the World Bank. And thank God I was supported and able to do that. Otherwise, you couldn't function. And then finally, before I finish in this um, 
toward Horizon. There is another issue which is going to be very important for all of us, which is Africa. Africa currently has about a billion people. Its GDP per capita runs around two to three thousand dollars per capita. And maybe by 2050, we will have, not maybe, it's, it's likely that we will have a population there, not of one billion, but two billion. That will be 20% of the global population. And with some optimism, it will reach four to five thousand dollars per capita income. That would be the outside it would reach. At that stage, India will be $25,000 per capita, and China, 40000 And then there'll be a number of intervening countries, and then the OECD countries will be eighty to 100000 So you'll have 2 billion people in the world with a four dollars to $5,000 per capita income. China and India, between twenty-five dollars and $40,000, with four, tri 4 billion people, maybe 40% of the world. And you will have... Uh, in the rich countries incomes that are 20 times the size of Africa which by the way they are now but it'll be a 2 billion person Africa and it'll be a mobile Africa and it's an Africa that is not sending signals to each other uh, with uh, smoke signals <laughs> it is the largest market for cellular phones at the moment or one of the largest markets and is essentially becoming part of the world in every way. And so if you can imagine two billion people with let's say five thousand dollars per capita, where the rest of the world is whatever it is, and if they have mobility, that becomes a very different world in which we're living. And it is an area of the future which very simply is not thought about much at all by anybody in the West. There is some money going to Africa, but if you talk to bright young people in the State Department or other places about becoming the Africa expert and going to Zimbabwe to be the ambassador, that would not be the first choice, not surprisingly. And so we need to have talent that is looking at the African situation, and it's just not there. Institutions like the World Bank, thankfully, I think, are doing a great job. The African Development Bank is doing a great job. And some individuals are doing great jobs, some that I know well in terms of education and in trying to build the next core of people to lead the African continent. But it's surprising that I would be speaking at a dinner here in Australia and be talking to you about the African issue. But it is going to be an issue for our kids, which there's very little doubt, as will China and India, as will the shift to, to Asia. Well, I could go on a lot longer and ruin your desserts, so I think I probably should stop here because I think we're going to have a period of questions. But I hope that gives you some glimpse of the way I at least see the world coming along. It is not a world which is lost to us. It's not a world that we can't adapt to and that we can't get ready for. And it's not a world with enlightened leadership we can continue to play a leadership role. But it requires a different attitude of mind on the part of both business and government if we're going to meet the challenge. And if I could go on another half hour, I might be able to convince you that it really is necessary for us to meet the challenge. Thank you very much.